was a 17-year-old uh, high school graduate. I moved to Effingham. By the time I reached age 20, I had decided to buy a Corvette. Uh, and buying that Corvette, I got kind of excited about the Corvette world and the Corvette hobby. And uh, so in 1973, I borrowed $500. And that summer, I also borrowed my friend's uh, Oldsmobile to go to my first Corvette show, take all my merchandise to Bloomington Gold at the time in uh, Bloomington, Illinois, and, and sell products. And we sold so many products and had so many requests. Uh, that was kind of the, the genesis, the bubble up of how Mid-America started. The real need that I saw early on was that you couldn't buy stuff for Corvettes at any one location. You could buy individual items from different companies. And I thought, well, I ought to aggregate it, put it all together under one roof. So the first catalog that we did was a one-sheet mimeograph flyer. And, you know, like a lot of things in a small town and a startup business, uh, we did that at John Boos and Company. And that, uh, that's interesting because they're a very, very successful business here in Effingham. And it's kind of neat to think that part of my beginning started with the help of John Boos and Company using their mimeograph machine. But our direct mail company started with humble beginnings, one ream of paper at a time on a mimeograph machine, up to millions, multiple millions of catalogs each year mailed worldwide. In 1998, we added to our Corvette line the Volkswagen aftermarket and parts and accessories. Although over the years I've had a lot of cool Corvettes, I hadn't really collected any. Uh, I'd save them for a while, then I'd get an opportunity to sell them and make some money, but my collection really started in 88, 89, and from that collection we've assimilated a collection up to 50 Corvettes, a uh, vintage air-cooled Volkswagen, and then we sold off part of our collection to really focus on high-end, unique, one-off cars. The My Garage Museum really started as a R&D center. We had this beautiful collection of cars that we would develop new products for and lo and behold Mike would always bring customers over here and give them sneak peeks of it and then the door, everybody started knocking on the door and wanted to see the museum so we decided to go ahead and open the collection to the public to view and it's been a huge success. Corvette Fun Fest started as a Corvette appreciation party for our customers. We had 300 people the first year, the first eight years or so we included free food and free drinks for all of our customers that came. It's the biggest Corvette party in the world. We'll get uh, 40,000 people, 12, 14,000 Corvettes from all over the United States as well as many different countries. Uh, it's a weekend long festival just to celebrate the Corvette and the passion people have for it. So when we wrap up Corvette Fun Fest, uh... And at the end of September, we always have uh, the stage already set up, ready to go. Um, the venue is essentially ready to go for another event. Uh, and from there, we've come up with the idea of having Effingham Music Fest. Effingham Music Fest is a full-day country music festival. Uh, we open our gates typically around noon. We're playing music until 10 o'clock at night. Uh, it's definitely a family atmosphere uh, for a, a concert festival, if you will. And you know, when I compare and contrast Effingham to other areas twice our size, and sometimes three times or four times, uh, we always come up the winner. You know, being a major shipper, uh, we ship hundreds of thousands of packages uh, with various carriers each year. And Effingham ranks with cities of 100,000 as far as the commerce that goes on here. And how can you not live in a small town America but yet have the amenities of larger cities? And uh, whether it's food, transportation, there's just so much happening here. Trail program, TREC uh, is what it's called, stands for Trail Recreation Effingham County. Um, and really it's the vision of TREC um, to really have a trail system throughout the entire county. Um, now the trail that exists today um, connects Unit 40 um, to, uh, in essence, Lake Sarah at this point. Um, 
and uh, very soon the city of Effingham is going to be opened up to the trail through a, uh, a bridge over the interstate, um, which we're very excited about. That, that bridge is not open at this point in time, but uh, should be open very soon. And so that will actually connect the city of Effingham all the way out to Lake Sarah area. So that is the, uh, that's how things are laid out currently. Um, uh, however, you know, our vision is also then to connect Effingham to neighboring Teotopolis and then to really expand the trail from there. Probably the best uh, spot right now is the Effingham Performance Center. Um, their parking lot actually is a, um, is a great place to park and really get on the trail. Um, we um, um, uh, have a couple of parking lots in phase three uh, as well which are not finished quite yet, uh, but we'll also be able to get on the trail at uh, Hilltop Estates and also Kingwood uh, Estates. Uh, those are two subdivisions close to the Lake Sarah area, uh, which will have parking lots and, and uh, people can, can drive and get on the trail there as well. The Trek Trail is a outstanding uh, asset really for Effingham County. Um, the trail uh, has, has expanded um, through uh, the work of a lot of local volunteers. Um, the county, the city, the park district, uh, landowners uh, and donors um, in Effingham County have been quite generous um, and have allowed us to really put this program together. In 1859, Bernard Hodebeck uh, started a boot and shoe store. He was the owner, the proprietor, uh, in downtown Effingham. And over the course of the years, it changed locations a couple times. But the last location was at 115 West Jefferson Street, where Brown's Drug Store is now. Bernard and his wife, Elizabeth, had seven daughters, the Hodebeck sisters. In 1885, Bernard retired, and so the two oldest daughters opened a millinery store for women in that location that had been their, the dad's boot and shoe store. Of the sisters, uh, one, one kept the books, one fired the furnace, uh, one did the general cleaning. Uh, three of them usually were clerks in the store. Um, one of them did a lot of the cut work that they sold, and that was, uh, uh, Catherine Hodebeck Stockman, who was uh, my grandmother. Their advertising was done by postcard, and they sent these to their clientele in the mail. A, a postcard for, um, for Easter would, uh, um, there would be a, a, a lady in a beautiful hat or there would be maybe even just a hat, and there would be a very, very flowery Victorian verse with it. In, in the spring, women would bring in their hat, and then the Hodebeck sisters would take off the winter things, the feathers, and the, the dark grosgrain ribbon, and the fur, and, and they would, uh, put on the, uh, uh, the ribbons, the colorful ribbons and the flowers and make it for spring. And then in the fall, they would reverse the procedure. They even crocheted a beautiful dress and hat for a little great granddaughter. Um, by the name of Mary Ellen Eversman. And um, it 
happened, I guess, on that day that, that this sweet child was not particularly interested in standing there in, in that outfit and being the sweet little girl, you know, that they'd hoped for in the picture. The, the Hodebeck store closed in 1925 with the death of uh, Mary, one of the original proprietors. And um, that was after they had served Effingham for 40 years. And so I think uh, they had a large part in making downtown Effingham a wonderful place that people from all over the area, women especially, uh, would, would want to come. We have all walks of life come through the door first off. Um, being a Harley shop, it can be a tourist destination too because everybody wants to maybe stop and buy a t-shirt, at least check it out, and the appeal of the big barn theme is catchy right off the road. Um, so we have a lot of that. Um, maybe a big misperception of motorcycle riders and sometimes the rougher crowd, they do get that stereotype sometimes, but uh, we're highly involved with our community, especially our local one, even though we do cover a large market area reaching all the way up to Tuscola and, and way further south too. So we uh, host a annual car show with a local car club and all of those proceeds go to the Habitat for Humanity um, right here directly in our county. Um, it's not going outside. Uh, we do a Kansas City Barbecue Society a state sanctioned cook-off every year and those proceeds go to various benefactors. This year we worked with the FKM Chamber of Commerce and it was a huge help um, to help raise some money for their scholarship program they have at Lakeland College. Other things, you know, that, that we do when we have some of our events, um, and then back to that whole stereotypical motorcycle rider thing, yes, we do like to get a little wild and, and party a little bit and have everybody have a good time, always with precautions and safety in mind, but we do what we do, and we usually do it always for a good cause. And the, it kind of brings me to the idea of the military support that Harley-Davidson brings to the table. It's just always been huge, not because it's recently a popular thing. Harley-Davidson's always been very supportive of any veterans and stuff. And, and this past year, we were able to raffle off a brand new motorcycle and pay for a trip for a local soldier who lost a, a leg in Iraq. And uh, it just meant the world to him, and he's a local kid. We have bank presidents, we have lawyers, doctors, and we've got guys that's ridden their entire life and their face can <laughs> tell it too sometimes. But you know, really, it's everybody has that common interest and you wouldn't believe the, you know, you share those stories and about, you know, riding and the road and there's a huge camaraderie thing that's the, the biggest draw, I think, to owning a Harley Davidson. It's comfortable here. It's fitting, uh, the pace is good and I really enjoy the atmosphere that we are in all the time at work. Um, I don't even really like to call it work sometimes. We have a lot of fun though, but we do, we are very serious, um, and I just enjoy our product and everything that we do that it involves. Um, Effingham is a wonderful town. Uh, it's got a lot of things going for it, location is good, um, and we have some really nice, respectable businesses here and hopefully will continue to grow. I think you always miss a lot when you don't veer off the beaten path. Um, and this is coming from me as a motorcycle rider. Uh, if you just ride on the interstate the whole way, you just see what you see. But when you take those roads and the off the beaten path roads, you get to see those really grassroots of a town that uh, really started it all. So if you don't make a pass through downtown Effingham, you're, you're kind of missing the roots and the character of, of this town as a whole. Two stories are these. One is uh, there was a Lord Effingham who during the American Revolution, he was an English Lord, and this, this English Lord refused to take up his sword against the colonists. And so as a consequence of that then uh, in Georgia, for instance, there is an Effingham County named after him. Now one idea that people have, because nobody knows the full story, 
But one idea is that we were carrying on that same tradition here within our county and we named the county first and then the community after this Lord Effingham. Second viewpoint is that there was a General Edward Effingham who lived at approximately the same time as this community was developed and the county was developed. And he was a surveyor and that he, he was in this area and that because of his survey work, very commonplace practice was that people would name a community after the chief surveyor or a surveyor in the area. And so one of the things that we find is if we go back into the Illinois Central archives and, and the literature from Illinois Central, where the Illinois Central Railroad uh, tells stories about how communities got their name, Illinois Central literature says that the name was the consequence of the surveyor. Now, more glamorous is the story of an English lord who took up this, you know, we refused to take up sword against the United States colonies, but uh, I, I, I think probably it was the surveyor rather than the English lord. This hospital here was initially built in 1876, so it was an old wooden structure with a brick shell around it. Uh, it was added on to four times, and so it was a sort of a patchwork with problems that were uh, created because of the patchwork. There were no smoke detectors, there were no fire alarms, there were no automatic sprinklers, and automatic sprinklers had been around since 1930, so that wasn't a new idea. Probably one of the worst problems was the stairwells. There were three staircases, and they were totally open from the basement up to the attic, so fire could go directly up that fire staircase without anything to uh, impede its progress. On the night of the fire, um, there was a change of shifts about 11 o'clock, and the fire itself was first noticed around 11.30. There was a delay before the fire department was notified. Now the nurses who were there and the sisters who came from the convent and the neighbors uh, came to the building and threw mattresses down on the ground for people to jump on, and many of them do, did do that. Nevertheless, there were 76 people that died. 88% uh, of those people were women and children. The nurse that's really the focus of my current research is Shirley Clements, however. She was originally from Belleville, and she was a nurse cadet, uh, and she um, graduated in uh, 1948 and then almost immediately got married. So by 1949, she was in Effingham with her nine-month-old nine daughter and her husband living in an apartment on South Banker. She wasn't supposed to be at the hospital on the night of the fire. She had actually resigned on April 1st. But the hospital called her and asked her to do one more night of private duty. So she did. She was there that night caring for an elderly woman. She got that woman out of the building. Now Shirley Clements was four foot, 10 inches tall and weighed 100 pounds. So that was quite an achievement. But she didn't stop there, she went back. She went back multiple times, and finally when she jumped from the second story, her uniform was on fire. She hit the ground with a thud, and she fractured her hip as she fell. She was taken almost immediately by ambulance to uh, Granite City, where she had trained, and she was cared for there by some of her former classmates. Unfortunately, she died that night, less than 24 hours from the time the fire was discovered, of respiratory burns, esophageal burns, and burns, second and third degree burns over 90% of her body. So it was a very tragic event, but it has meaning for us today. And the meaning is that because of her death and the death of the other 75 people who died in the fire, we have a much safer environment in hospitals. The hospital was rebuilt and it reopened in 1954 and the new building was entirely different. I worked in that hospital in the late 60s and early 70s, and I can tell you that fire safety was taken very, very seriously. Fire drills were frequent and they were monitored. We now have the Life Safety Code, which is uh, promulgated by the National Fire Safety Administration. It's a thick book, and it has uh, chapters that are devoted to every single issue that was a problem at the time of the hospital fire. 
And then finally, probably the most important part, the most important lesson of the hospital fire is that we have better fire safety nationally now because of the hospital fire and other fires like it. So Shirley Clement and those other 75 people didn't die in vain. <laughs> and we are back. Thank you so much for watching tonight. We're celebrating Effingham. This is our story. I'm Kian. This is Jaina. And we have a studio full, full of, of Effingham residents tonight. We're having a great time. Mm -hmm. It's been so much fun. And you know, when we were on before and the phones were ringing, amazing it rang so much. I want to give a shout out though really quick to Larry Marksman. That is Brian's father. And I mispronounced his name. So thank you so much, Larry, for calling in. Thank you to Linda Ruha. She's here in our studio, I believe, tonight. Thank you, Maxine Dane. Is she in the she's in our she's studio? In the studio. And Glenn Bauer, who's in yes. our studio. Thank you, Glenn. All Delane, of our story They're all here. Delane Donaldson. Thank you so much, Delane. We really appreciate it. And Jerry Jansen called. He's from Century 21. We wanted to make sure and thank you too, Jerry. And Ruth McCarty called from Springfield. So that's awesome. That is awesome. And the phones are ringing right mm -hmm. now, but we still have some open. So be sure to call the number at the bottom of your screen. You can see the great thank you gifts right there that when you contribute to WEIU, you're saying thank you so much for documenting the history of Effingham and all the stories being told about that wonderful town. Now there is a story that I want to tell you. Loella Baker right there behind us on the phone said that there was a lady that called in and she said that she had two children, one on the East Coast, one on the West mm -hmm. Coast. And she wanted to get two of those DVDs to send oh, to her cool. children and she said, the reason I want to send them to them is because I moved back to Effingham and she said this is why I moved back to Effingham. Wow. I want them to see what Effingham is all about. Wow. And you know what? We're getting a great representation of what Effingham sure. is all about tonight. Mm -hmm. Lori, we're going to talk to you for just a second. Who do you have over there on the living room? Well, I've got some of our storytellers here and I need to share in that la one of those last pictures in Linda's story is them putting out the fire, practicing with fire extinguishers, and that's you. All right, so we're learning all sorts of things, but I have Glenn Bauer next to me, and he did the story on the Centenary Methodist Church. That's an interesting name. Tell us where that name comes from. It, uh, the church uh, took that name when they built a new building, and it was in the centennial year, basically, of the, Weth uh, of the Methodist Church uh, movement in America. So we're going to hear more about the history of that church in just a little bit. Glenn was great. He was able to rattle off all these dates because the church moved several times. It did not actually start in Effingham. Where did it start? It started in the original county seat of Ewington, uh, which uh, was about three miles west of Effingham. But when the railroad, uh, the Illinois Central, now the Canadian National, was built, uh, it was built in Effingham. And Ewington, everything in Ewington basically moved to Effingham and Ewington is no longer in existence. Okay, so had that not happened, we would be saying, Ewington, this is our story. But instead, it's Effingham, this is our story. And we hope you're enjoying this program tonight. You know, we have 32 different stories, and actually there's probably more like 50 people that are involved in this program because some of the other storytellers, people um, provided interviews for us. We had several veterans and several Rotarians who were involved in the show. So we've got about 50 Effingham area residents involved in this program. So we're so glad that you're enjoying the show and so glad that phone is ringing. Back over to the ladies. I'll be able to say thank you to you next. So in order to do that, you need to give us a call. The number at the bottom of your screen, we have phone operators standing by and the people behind us are from Effingham. You may know them, you may work with them, or they may live next to you. So give us a call right now, talk to one of them and say, hey, I'd love to have a copy of that DVD. You've done a great job putting those stories together, sharing those stories, and I'm learning some things that I may not have known about Effingham. But you know what, if you do know them, even give them a call and say, hey, thanks for being a part of that and showcasing Effingham tonight. We're celebrating tonight. This is a great representation of what Effingham is all about. Jana and I have been down in, the, in your town for a number of different times and you know what? Lots of people have come together and said, hey, we support one another, and that's what we're seeing here tonight. Lots of people calling in, supporting everybody that's been a part of this show. Jana, do we want to say thank you to a few more people? Sure we do. We'd like to give a shout out to Floyd and Dee Miller. Thank you so much for supporting this program right here on WEIU-TV. We've been talking all night about supporting something that's really, really important to you, and obviously by the phone calls we're getting,
this is important. Kevin Jamison just called. He's from Watson. So thank you so much, Kevin. We really, truly do appreciate you. The phones are starting to get busy again. And when they start getting busy, I get to talking really fast. So I have to be careful about that. But Delane's on the phone, and so is Loretta. And looks like Amy's getting a call right now. So let's get Paul and Brian on the phone as well. It'd be exciting to get a big phone blitz going. So right now, you can give us a call. The number's on the bottom of the screen. We're going to throw it over, I think, to Lori. That's where we're going. I'm sorry. I just got, we are tweeting tonight um, at our story, uh, our story Effingham. So if you want to send us a tweet, and we just got a message from our social media coordinator, Rob Calhoun, who says the Effingham Convention and Visitors Bureau is tweeting a lot about the show. So thank you so much for sharing that with us. We, when we interviewed the storytellers back in August at Stang Art Studio, we asked several of them, why do you stay in Effingham? What do you love about Effingham? So, Glenn, I'm going to ask you, how long have you lived in this area, and what's kept you here all these years? Well, I'm a lifelong uh, resident of Effingham County. My uh, parents were public school teachers that moved to Beecher City uh, during the Depression. That's where I grew up and was in high school. I got out of law school 40 years ago came back to Effingham and was elected uh, state's attorney two years after I graduated. Uh, I've had a, a great career and have got to do a lot of things. Uh, uh, I worked in Chicago and Springfield for a while, but uh, Effingham has always been home. That's where my family is, and it's a great community where uh, I retired back to. Now, you told us earlier that when we aired, ran the story about the courthouse, your office, when you were state's attorney, was in that original courthouse, right? That is correct. When the, the pictures of the courthouse that are taken from the southeast corner or the southwest corner, my office was uh, in the southwest corner of the courthouse on the second floor. That was the historic state's attorney's office. Okay, and it's so nice to see that that building is restored Absolutely. and is such a cornerstone of downtown Effingham. So we want to thank everybody who's called in tonight and became a member, supported this program. It's going to help us do more shows just like this. What town is next? It might be yours, but right now it's all about Effingham. Right, Kian? That's right, Lori. Thank you so much. And thank you for joining us tonight in those discussions over in the other part of our studio. We're calling it the living room side, but this side is the phone side. And we've got people calling in right now. We want to thank you for doing that. We will give you a shout out in just a few moments. But we do have some operators standing by back here and they're waiting to take your call. The number is at the bottom of your screen. It's 1-877-727-9348. And you can call us right now. And you know what? You may be thinking, hey, you know what, the holidays are coming up and I'd like to get a gift for somebody and you may not know what to get them. Well, you know what, what a better gift to give somebody around the holidays, something from your own hometown. You can say, hey, watch this. You may not know something about this story, but you know what, I found it enticing. I found something that I think is really great and I wanna have a copy and I wanna give you a copy too. And you have the opportunity to do that as well. All you have to do is go to the phone, give us a call at the number at the bottom of your screen. Jane, back to you. Thank you, Ken. I'd like to give a shout out to Kevin and Barb Jamison. We didn't include Barb well ago, and we sure do not want to leave anybody out. So thank you so much for giving. Ken, you were just talking about, come on over here. You were just talking about giving this as a gift to somebody for the holidays or right. birthdays. I want one myself. Are you kidding me? <laughs> and, you know, I, I don't live in Effingham, but you know what? I've learned to appreciate the people, the places, the history of Effingham. I truly, truly, these people in the studio tonight have become friends. They have. And you know what? We've met them not only by going down there, but by talking to them and getting mm -hmm. to know them. So they really are friends. And we can call them by name. Jane and I have been able to visit Effingham a few times, and we've been driving down the road or walking down the road. Somebody we know. And we'll say, hey, how are you doing? You know, and they know our names too. So they you do. know what? This is what Effingham mm -hmm. is really all about. It's sure about is. community, it's about friends, and it's about mm -hmm. creating relationships. And that's what you're doing tonight when you're giving us a call here. You're creating relationships, mm -hmm. not only with the people answering the but phone, with but with WEIU. Mm -hmm. And WEIU is one big happy family. We talk about that at our other mm -hmm. pledge drives. This is a little something different. This is an entire community that's supporting a program that's really, really important. That's right. And you know what? Some of those people are still here with us tonight mm -hmm. over in the studio, and we want to hear more from them. Go ahead, Lori. Well, Glenn and I were just visiting about he's retired now and how he's spending his retirement. Um, but I want to talk about coming up in this next segment, we're going to hear Maxine's story on the Dane Letters, and she does a beautiful job of explaining the story that uh, her father-in-law was involved in. And we've got another great story about um, a man in Effingham who likes to go fast in his car, his uh, uh, Avante uh, 
Studebaker Avante, thank you. And I think if you're from Effingham, you know who I'm talking about. We'll also be taking a look at the farmer's market in Effingham and uh, looking back at a famous house that a lot of people know of called the Austin Mansion. So great stories coming up. Don't go away. We're going to check out, see where things are at. I see Kian over there. Where, where, how are things going, Kian? Hey, things are going great. The phones are busy, but we still do have people standing by to take your call right now. And as we mentioned earlier, the holidays are coming up. If you would like to get a copy to give to somebody, maybe a close friend, a family member, someone that maybe lives out of the viewing area, go ahead and give us a call right now. We're going to get back to the program in just a moment, but we're going to be standing right by the phone so you can call us during the program, not only on the breaks, the number is at the bottom of your screen, and you can give us a call right now. So right now we're going to get back to the show. Effingham, this is our story. Ooh. Okay. The brainchild was Martin Hubbard, and then, you know, it became a, a crystallized into a project well funded by investors, and I was one of them, and AgraCell, which is a local company. So the theater was built, opened the doors in 2007, and under the name of the Rosebud Theater, and had very good two years, except that, towards the end of 2008, 2009, with the economic downturn, then the deficit began to escalate, and he had to close the doors. And, you know, the idea of coming back as a non-for-profit organization, then gain more, you know, um, acceptance and some of the prior investors and the new volunteers, and we created a new organization called ACCI, which is a non-for-profit -for you know, organization for the arts. And uh, thanks to the city of Effingham and Midland States Bank, uh, we were able to reopen the door, uh, the doors in 2010. Now is, this is more of a community uh, project. The community is proud of it. We are proud of it and it's gaining more popularity and uh, it's, it's beginning to grow. And we are not only interested in, in contracting performance with a well-known name, we also like to promote education, opportunities for children. We have summer uh, theaters for for kids to perform. Just the last one, we had over 70 kids that signed up. We have $5 sessions for local groups that want to perform and get started and get used to a stage. So it, it has that function as well, and we are very interested in making sure that the facility can be accessed by different areas of interest and endeavor, not just the big names. The way to make the community better is to achieve that balance. You know, we want a strong hospital, good medical services, nice sports facility, facilities, uh, good nursing homes. Entertainment should also be balanced. We should have opportunity for the arts, uh, performing and also artistic endeavors like the Stang uh, facility that we are enjoying. And so that makes for a community that has um, all the areas that are important in life uh, present and readily available. So, you know, many citizens don't have to travel too far to enjoy the different facilities and opportunities we have. I love the community and I believe uh, myself and my family, my wife, we believe that uh, it's not that we want to look for a better community, it's simply how we can make the community we live in better. And that's what, what keeps us here and we belong here. Well, 
the farmer's market started as just one guy kind of going to the mall and sitting out there with a friend or two of his and selling what he had that year for produce, sometimes eggs. I, after the mall was going on for a few years, they grew to be big enough that people were driving out there, but it still wasn't the ideal location. So, And then they worked with the county to see if they could use the county courthouse grounds downtown. And that has really made things blossom since they started there. Uh, a lot of people from the community, it brings them out. It revitalizes downtown. It helps bring businesses some customers. And it's just a nice meet and greet kind of place. There's open grass. We have the gazebo with music. We try to really focus on local produce and local artisans. So our produce is not shipped in from outside the area. We serve what's fresh, what's local, and we have um, a variety of things that might not be available in the area, but just outside the area. So really just a county or two away would be our tops for just a couple of items. But almost all of our farmers are from Effingham County. When I will post on Facebook what, what we're going to have this week, here's some of, the idea, some of the items available, and I think people check it. They see, oh, well, let's see what they have this week. Oh, good, they have that, so I'm going to come down. They will be waiting in line for that 8 o'clock bell to ring. So that's really shown that the community is a lot more excited. I see people milling about. I see them walking their dogs, bringing their families. I see them using this as a place not just to pick up food and leave, like a grocery store, but a place to really get to know members of the community. So I see a lot of people introducing each other, meeting each other. Some people even arrange, I've even met friends down there at a certain time to get a coffee and have some muffins and just buy the food for the week. So. It's really kind of just been a social hub. One thing that I think also is kind of fun is we most weeks will have live music in the gazebo and that kind of livens things up. And we use um, local people for that too, just to give some kids an opportunity to play their acoustic guitar or maybe there's a duet that wants to sing. We've had a lot of variety in our music too, so that kind of, that's pretty fun. We have a whole corner of the courthouse yard that we've yet to expand to. We have been pretty full this year in the area that we're utilizing. Our vendors set up a little at a time and um, I think that it, the more food that we get, the more interest we get, the more variety we get. I think that's really been growing. This year alone I've had Oh gosh, I mean I would say at least 50 new vendors uh, apply to vend there and they already had a pretty substantial amount. So every week it's different, they're not required to come every week. So what's nice is that it's not a commitment that they pay every week. They pay a one-time annual fee, they can set up or come whenever they want, don't come when you want. It depends what they're growing, what they're raising, when it's in season. And I think the more varieties that I'm seeing is what's really expanding it. There's a lot about Effingham that is different than a lot of other small towns. Um, the people are very, very friendly, very accessible, very open, very inviting. Uh, I would come down here to visit my grandparents my whole childhood and I always wanted to live here. So um, it just has a very homey, welcoming vibe about it and people are so nice that I experience things that I would never experience in a larger town. Picking up dry cleaning, oh I forgot my cash, oh pay us next time. Um, getting my car over at the shop for some scratches and seeing how much was it to you know just touch those up oh don't worry about it pay it um, come to us when you have a bigger job just show us your business that kind of thing you don't get in a bigger city and you really um, get to know the people you live with and there's a good sense of community here I'm just a land speed racer. I race at the Bonneville Salt Flats. That's where the fastest people on earth go to race. If there's any fame to it, I am in the 200 mile per hour club. You have to set a record at 200 mile per hour or over. And I done that in 1996. In 1949, they started their first sanctioned racing there at Bonneville. And uh, in that 70 year period or so, there's only 700 people that's ever got into this. 200 mile per hour club because you have to set a record a lot of people go 200 mile per hour and 300 and 400 but you've got to set a record and that's what I did in 1996 to get into the two club. I was at Studebaker meet in South Bend in 1988 at the international meet and I was showing my car and a fellow come up to me and was interested in my car and and he was from West Chicago and he was taking his uh, Studebaker Avanti to Bonneville that year in 1988 and uh, 
I got to talking to him and got interested in his racing. And so the following year, I went as a crew member and I got struck with salt fever, which there's no cure, you know. So once you get that, and I've been racing out there, I've, in the last 24 years that I've raced, I've been out there 11 times to do so. And uh, it just gets in your blood and you just want to go faster and faster. I have a Studebaker Avanti in 1963. That's a sports car that was built by Studebaker to save their company. And uh, Studebaker went bankrupt and went out of business in uh, December of 1963. So this car, because uh, it was a limited production car, very few were made. And so I thought this would be really unique to take this car and run there with a Studebaker engine that came in it. A lot of guys use Chevrolet motors and Ford, but I wanted to do it with Studebaker power. And so the first year I was out there, I had 438 horsepower, and I went 168 mile per hour. Not enough horses. So the following year, I, I built uh, uh, more things into the engine, and I kept progressing. In 09, when I set my latest record, I had 1,100 horsepower available. My newest engine that I'm going back with next year is going to be over 1,400 horsepower. So, and I do my own work. I fabricate all the parts. Um, I make my own camshafts and rocker arms. And very few people do that. Most of the guys racing there, they'll have, <coughs> excuse me, professional engine builders who do their work. And uh, I, I take uh, pride in doing my own. My friend said that the No. 9, it was absolute. This was the last time I was going out. It was finished, it was done. Never say never. You know, I, I just want to, uh, I want to go faster. The house was built in 1892, and it was built by Calvin Austin, hence the name, the Austin Mansion. He and his family lived there for only about eight years, and then in year, the year 1900, it was purchased by a man named Louis Bissell and he started the Illinois College of Photography. So there's a lot of people in town who remember, who refer to that property as the Old Photography College. It's kind of a common name used to refer to it. And that college ran for about 35 years. And what's really cool about the life that that college gave to that house was that over its 35 years, there was attendees to that college from every single state in the United States, every province of Canada, and then also 50 foreign countries. So as you can imagine, you know, from the years 1900 to 1935, how amazing that really is to have all those people to have come to Effingham for that purpose. There was a brief time from 1935 to 1945 when it was just used for corporate offices. Nothing too exciting, but um, that was definitely another use that the home has had. But then in 1945, they changed it into apartments, which changed the house a lot from the inside structural integrity um, and just the overall purpose of it too, because it was made into 13 individual apartments. Um, so there's a lot of people, as I mentioned earlier in town when I referenced that, that a lot of, I've had a lot of older couples, um, it's been really sweet, they have so many fond memories of that house because that was the first place they lived when they got married. And then in 1980, um, there was a fire call there and the it didn't end up amounting to much. However, um, the fire marshal came in and they found that the house was not safe, so they closed it down. And then the house sat completely vacant for a decade. And then the next really cool life that came to the house was in the early 90s, a local businessman, businessman purchased the home and he, um, he and his wife had the desire to make it into a bed and breakfast. And so he partnered with a local school and the shop class and then some of the local contractors and they all got together and made it a really great community effort and they transformed it from a place that had been boarded up on the windows to be in a place that could operate as a bed and breakfast. So they changed it into a facility that has eight bedrooms, all with attached baths. And um, they operated that bed and breakfast for, I don't know, in the general of about five years. A man had moved to town with his family and he had a lot of children. And so they approached him and they, the, 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 uh, the, the Martins were the name of the couple that was running the bed and breakfast. So they approached them and said, you know, we'd really like to buy this house. And I actually spoke with Mr. Martin about this and he said, you know, we weren't really at a time when we wanted to sell it because we were really enjoying it. And it was such, it brought so much joy to their lives, but they've just felt like it was the right time to maybe part ways with the property. So that family bought it, but they lived there for about seven months and then it remained vacant for another two years. So it essentially died once again until another couple bought it 
Um, and then they spent about four years renovating again, and they are the people that we purchased the home from. So it's thanks to their hard work and their, um, they had a background in history and engineering, so they, you know, it was a love for them when they redid the house, and they just, they have made it an amazing home. And um, so that's the current state that we purchased it in. The business that we're in is the wedding business, and there is a great potential there to use that property for weddings, so that was our motivation in purchasing the property. What's been so neat to me is that everywhere, and I say that with a grain of salt because I know that's an exaggeration, but everywhere I go in town, people will come up to me as the lady that bought the Austin Mansion because they have a story about it. They know someone who lived there, or they have a brother's uncle who lived there, um, or they remember it as a bed and breakfast. So it's been through a lot of different lives over the years. Um, and it's also kind of had a couple of deaths as well. And so we're excited because our hope is that we're gonna give it a new life moving forward. In 1949, Effingham was a very small Midwestern town of 6,900 people, and it had its usual rivalries between clubs, teams, churches, etc. Uh, but all that was put aside on the night of April 4th, 1949, when a horrific fire hit St. Anthony Hospital, a Catholic site which was run by the Third Order of the Hospital Sisters of St. Francis. And the very next morning, while the ashes were still smoldering and they were still searching for bodies, a group of 10 businessmen met and formed what was to be the Effingham Civic Foundation. One of the men who became a co-chairman was my father-in-law, George Dane, who was vice president at that time of the Effingham State Bank. And the other men were bankers, uh, optometrists, lawyers, just everybody from Main Street came together. They were all Protestants, and they got together to rebuild this Catholic hospital. Part, part of the fundraising was uh, an idea conceived by George Dane to send out letters telling the story of Fern Riley, a young nurse who was in charge of the nursery that night and who died along with her babies, uh, and asking for just one dollar and the names of two or three of any friends they had who might want to help. The letters were sent to all the Irish sounding names in the telephone books of large cities like Boston, Chicago, Philadelphia, and the <clears throat> results were tr phenomenal. Mail poured into Effingham. A 27-foot thermometer was placed on the courthouse lawn, and as the mercury went toward the $6 million goal, the fundraising became more intense. There were door-to-door -door collections. Children emptied their piggy banks. Girl Scouts and Boy Scouts stopped cars on the road and asked for, for help. The Effingham Daily News, our local paper, published the amounts gathered by the Dane Litter every day, and also with the, the any amounts that came in from other sources. So the public was always aware of how things were progressing. The hospital was dedicated on May 15, 1954. It had been decided that the new building would be <clears throat> named St. Anthony's Memorial Hospital in honor of all those who had lost their lives. The people of Effingham, with the help of the world, proved what seemed to be impossible could be done. I got a call from Betty Flack, who lived in uh, uh, Shumway, and she told me that I had to do a story on the, uh, the Druin uh, girl statue. It had been vandalized. 
And she sort of caught my attention when she said it had been beheaded. Her name was Emma Druin. She died in 1914. Her parents and a younger sister were devastated by her death. And her parents decided to do something a little different at the time. Instead of just putting a elaborate uh, tombstone on her grave, they decided to have a statue made that was based on a photo of Emma. It was sculpted in Italy, and it even had her image in a, in a glass oval. And it became uh, sort of a landmark in Oak Ridge uh, Cemetery here in, in Effingham. I uh, wrote the story, and basically Betty said that, you know, put in there that if anybody just wants to return the head, uh, they can just put it in the grave, the graveyard. And apparently that happened. The sextant, uh, a couple days later, found the head. And so that made it possible to restore the uh, statue. This brought a, a lot of interest. And so they, uh, an effort was made uh, in a local monument company, uh, uh, worked to, to uh, restore the statue. And uh, also they prepared some of the damage over the years. Uh, there had been um, vandalism to the uh, BB shot at the image of uh, Emma Druin. Uh, they had also uh, damaged her fingers and her feet. So it was really taking a beating and apparently they didn't even put paint on, the, uh, on her head, uh, pink paint. So they wanted to clean it up and restore it. And, and there was a wonderful effort on that and it was done. Uh, you know, the head was reattached, but they did a, a very thorough um, restoration of it. But then everyone thought, well, what about Annie? Of course, it's 1993. Annie had died in 1981. Uh, she, and Annie had uh, tried to keep the poultry business going after her parents were gone, long gone, and eventually it, it, it folded. And Annie uh, ended, up, ended up dying penniless. Betty suggested, maybe we should do something for Annie, and an effort was made to to put a stone up for Granny, and they, so they're now all there, you know, with stones, and the family plot is still there, but we have this um, wonderful uh, statue and memorial to not only Emma, but to the uh, Druin family. And I think what I learned from that story, you know, I, I wrote a few stories on it, is the fact that was the spirit of Effingham, that, you know, if people in FAM were shown something needed to be done, they'd do it. And it was out of, out of love or out of doing the right thing. And we are back here with you, and we're having a great time tonight. But you know what? We want to say thank you so mm -hmm. much for Herb Meeker telling that story right there. Mm -hmm. What a touching story. Herb has told a lot of different mm -hmm. stories through the newspapers throughout the years, and that was one that stuck with him, very passionate mm -hmm. about sure. that story. But Herb, we also want to say thank you to mm -hmm. you because you have promoted this program through the Effingham Tutopolis News Report. So thank you so much for doing that. We really appreciate that. I've got a couple people to here. I'm going to give you half. Okay. Okay. Karen Lutchfield from Effingham, Warren Peters from Effingham, Warren is one of our current members, Susan Waltman from Effingham, Brad Wittenmeyer, and Stan Barnes is who I have. Thank you all so very much. Appreciate you calling in tonight and being that next person that we needed. So That's thank right. You. And I have a few to thank you here too, and I hope that I say the names right. It's Dave and Becky Reagan from Effingham. Marilyn Thompson from Mattoon, and Marilyn wants to say hi to Linda Ruhal. So hi, Linda. Um, Beatra Carter from Altamont, and Deidre Lynn and Sandra Loy, Loy from Effingham. So lots Thank of people you. calling in to support the storytellers this evening. Thank you so much for those calls. Can I talk about our goal tonight coming into this? We weren't, we weren't sure if we'd get calls. You never know when we do something like this. This is the first time that we've done it. So we didn't know if we'd get Effingham to people to call, but we've gotten to 50. And our goal is 100 callers. So if you're one of those people that want to get one of the DVDs as a thank you gift, right now is the time to give us a call. Brian is waiting for you to call. Paul is waiting for you to give him a call. And 
That's all. So, hey, we need you to call right now. The phone number's at the bottom of your screen. We would be thrilled to talk to you. We'll put your name on the air. If you'd like us to thank you on air, we'd be thrilled to do that. That's right. And you know what? When those phones ring, it gives mm -hmm. us a buzz of excitement in the studio. Not only us that are talking to you on air, but you know what? The room is filled mm -hmm. in here with people from Effingham. We've got some people standing by in our living room studio. <laughs> And this is Lori Casey right over here, and she's joined with Marion Burford. All right. Well, I had to coax her a little bit, but thank you for coming out and talking to us tonight. In your story, you talked about your mom would sit on this box and write these letters to your dad. Tell us a little bit about this, this, this box. Well, somehow mom acquired this box as a very young girl, and it moved with her and her family through several houses in Effingham, and it finally made it to Titopolis on top of the grocery store when she married my dad. And what, what did she kind of repurposed that? I mean, she fixed it up, and she used it for several things. What did you guys use it for? Well, she used it for a hope chest or a cedar chest where she, where she stored our blankets and extra things, you know. Um, and also Santa Claus got stored in there in the wintertime because the blankets were on the beds. And she put a, a padding on the top and covered it with, with plastic. And it was a nice, comfortable box. It even served as a bed when our Skulls cousins came from St. Louis to visit us. We needed extra beds, and two people could sleep at that. One head on one and one head on the other side. It was a long bed, and the box is still in the family. My oldest sister, Ruth, still has the box. Oh, that's wonderful. I was going to ask you, you said in your story that your parents exchanged letters every day while your dad was away. Do you still have those letters? Yes, I have mine. When we settled mom's estate, the letters got doled out in seven <laughs> piles. One, one, you know, everybody got the same amount of letters. Some of these letters were handwritten. Some of them were emails. Some of them showed the censor, you know, where words were blocked out or a whole phrase, sometimes even a whole line. Um, I have mine. I am sure other sisters still cherish theirs. They do. Well, thank you so much for sharing your story, and we hope you're enjoying our program tonight, Effingham. This is our story. We've had such a pleasure getting to meet everybody. Uh, Marion and I actually had to meet down in Effingham one day during a rainstorm because I needed a few more pictures, and I said, I'm coming down that way. Could you bring them? And lo and behold, it was raining cats and dogs, but she made it <laughs> <laughs> made it out anyway. And we've just enjoyed getting to meet everybody and put these stories together and share them with you tonight. Back to the ladies over at the phones. Thank you so much, Marion, for joining us in the studio tonight. Marion has been watching the program in the control room, and I'm so glad that she joined us in here. It's very exciting to have people travel to Charleston from Effingham and support the storytellers. She's one of the storytellers. She's joined over in the living room side with Maxine Dane. Uh, we just heard her story, uh, Linda Ruhal and Glenn you. Bauer over there. Over here on this side, we have Brian Marksman, Paul Simple. We have Delane Donaldson and Luella uh, Baker. I know you know these folks from Effingham. You can call them right now at the, bottom, at the number at the bottom of your screen and say, hey, thank you so much for being a part of Effingham. This is our story. I'd like a copy of that DVD. You might like a copy of that DVD to give to a, a, a family member, a, a child, someone who may be living somewhere on the coast, somewhere anywhere in the world that may not be able to share this experience with you tonight, and they would like a copy of the DVD. So right there on your screen, it says for a contribution of $75, you can receive a DVD, and if you want two or more, they're $60. So please give us a call right now, and we'd like to thank a few more people. So Jana, back to you. Thank you, Kian. I'd like to thank Pat Patricia Miller. Thank you, Patricia. Craig and Cynthia Weiss. Thank you so much. She's the one that did the uh, story on the winery, Tuscan Hills. And James Slifer from Mode. Thank you so much. Now, if you want to be the next person that I think on air, give us a call right now. The number's on the bottom of your screen. This is something that you could get. And as a gift to you, you could give it to somebody else, maybe a generational gift. Give it to your kids. Leave it for them to watch down the road. Or maybe you have somebody that lives out of town or somebody that maybe it's your grandmother who you never know what to get her for Christmas. Well, this is a free gift, so she could get that, and she would probably have many, many years of enjoyment with that. But you can call us right now. The number's on your screen. We'd love to talk to you and say thank to, thanks to you on the air. I'm going to send it back to you, Kim. 
that's right. I, I want to say thank you. I'm glad you did that because there was a few things that I left out earlier that I wanted to say. You know what? We met a great physician in Effingham. His name is Dr. Ruben Boyajan, and he told the story of the Effingham Performance Center. What a remarkable man, and I know there are a lot of people out there who really appreciate the work that he does on the physician side, but there's a lot that he does for the community. So you can call in tonight and say thank you, Dr. Boyajan, for being a part of this and giving the story of Effingham Performance Center. So give this a call right now at the bottom of your screen, and it's 1-877-727-9348. Not only do I want to say thank you to him, but you know what? We had a story on the farmer's market. We really enjoyed the farmer's market because Jana and I, and I'm going to step over here for just a second. Jana and I and Lori that we're going to mm -hmm. shoot uh, and not shoot, but <laughs> we're not going to shoot her. No, we say not. shoot when we use a camera. <laughs> but, uh, for, um, turn over to Lori here in just a minute, but we really enjoyed interviewing people at the Stang Art Gallery, mm -hmm. and when we did that, that was on a Saturday, mm -hmm. and we enjoyed the uh, farmer's market. So Lori, why don't we take it back over to you, and we're not going to shoot you, but we well, want to hear you. some more of the stories from the Effingham <laughs> residents over there. Well, I'm here with some of the storytellers, and you know how they say it's a small world? Well, when we were watching the story on the Austin Mansion, Glenn Bauer said, my aunt lived there in the 50s, and, and Billy Jansen said, someone always knows somebody who lived there because that house has such a long history. And speaking of families, y your mother was a Hodebeck, and we heard earlier from Mary Ellen Eversman, who talked about the Hodebeck Millinery Store, and it's kind of complicated, but Marion here is gonna try and explain how they're all related. <laughs> First of all, my mother was a James. It's James. my father oh. who was the Hodebeck. Okay. Okay. Well, my great, great, my great grandfather was Frederick Hodebeck from Titopolis, and he's the one who built our store building that was shown in this. He is a brother to Bernard Hodebeck, who lived in Effingham. Bernard Hodebeck and his wife had seven daughters. My father was Louis Hodebeck, and his wife, Lucille James, had seven daughters. And I talk about my father being um, drafted. He also got sent to Italy. And one day he had a one day pass and he got to go touring in Italy. And he thought he recognized this soldier walking down the street towards him in Rome. And the other guy had the same idea. I think I recognized that man walking down the street towards me. And here it's Henry Eversman, Mary Ellen's father. And her father and my father met each other in Rome. And they were both from Effingham and, County. And they're cousins. Wow. And they're both from Effingham County. See, these are the stories that we would never have gotten had WEIU just showed up in Effingham with our cameras. We needed the people of Effingham to help us with this project. And we got such great stories, things that go beyond what you can get out of a travel book. We've heard great stories, Linda Ruhal's story about Nurse Shirley Clements and Maxine's story about the Dane letters and all the wonderful ones we're seeing. And the great ones we're seeing tonight, coming up in the next segment, we're gonna hear Glenn Bauer talking about the history of Centenary United Methodist Church. We're gonna learn about the Thomas Shop and a great story about the building of Effingham High School. A great story of how people coming together to make things happen. Ladies, back to you. Thank you, Lori. I'd like to give a shout out and a thank you to Larry and Pat Milleville. Thank you so much. We'd like to thank Sharon Davis from Watson. Thank you, Sharon. And thank Bill Altman from Edgewood. We're getting calls from all over Effingham, and we really, really do appreciate you all calling tonight. This has been a fantastic night. Our goal is to get 100 callers, and right now we're up to almost 60. So we've got 40 more calls to get to get us to that 100 person goal. And if you are one of the people out there right now who say, I do value a program like this, I want to keep it for uh, my children. I want to keep it for my grandkids. I want them to know the history of Effingham that maybe you didn't even know some of the things that are going on and they would be able to enjoy it for years to come. I'm going to send it over to Ken. She's got somebody special that she wants to talk to. That's right. I'm Stephen Ryan Marksman. I'm going to hand you the microphone and I need you to hold it close to your mouth. Okay. Sure. Paul Simple and we have Amy Jones here but uh, Brian tell us a little bit about your story without giving too much away. Well I can tell you my story for a week long probably. 
But uh, basically my story is uh, about the pyrotechnics business, fireworks, and uh, how it's yeah. come from a hobby to an enjoyment to pleasing people. That's right. That's and one of the main goals I've tried to do. And so what did you tell me a, a minute ago? You used the slogan what? Oh, one of my slogans is making your skies brighter. That's right. And I'll tell you what, he has really done that not only through his story, he's doing it here tonight. He's talking to some people from Effingham. He's thanking them and saying, hey, I was part of this, and thank you so much for calling in and, and supporting me and my fellow residents here. Um, something else that we want to do, thank you so much, Brian. Okay. Something else we want to do is also say, say thank you to the Effingham Visitor, Visitors Bureau. I'm getting a little tongue-tied. Effingham Visitors Bureau, and I've got this little pig here. This is Have Pig, Will Travel. And so it has the, um, the Effingham uh, website on here, but you know what? It is a great place to visit because you can find out about all the great places to visit in Effingham, some of the things that we're talking about tonight. And, and they even contributed to our set here this evening. So the photos that you see behind us and behind Jaina over here and Loella and Delane, all of those are from the Visitor Center. So thank you so much for being a part of our story tonight, being a part of Effingham and offering all of those different things for people coming into your great town to know what they can be a part of. So right now, without further ado, we're going to go back to Effingham, This Is Our Story. Stay tuned. Mm -hmm. 